Hello. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone, again, for coming out here to this talk. Thanks to Matt and to all the people at Exploring Science for helping to get this set up. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Andrew. I'm a fourth year grad student. Hello in uh, Yassine Van Wolfswinkel's lab at Yale. And today I'm going to be telling you about some awesome, awesome worms uh, like this little guy here in my shoulder. Not, not an actual size, unfortunately. Uh, OK, so just as a, a roadmap quickly before we get started, I'm going to start by talking a bit about myself, how I got into science, what the various research experiences I've had thus far have actually looked like. Then we'll dive right into the science and start talking about what aging actually is and why I think it's worth studying. After that, we'll talk about planaria, which are the little creatures that I study, like again, this guy here in my shoulder, uh, and why they're super cool and unique and awesome. And then we'll talk about regeneration, what that word means, how the planaria do it. And finally, we can tie it all together uh, and talk a little bit about some of my actual data, which suggests that regeneration can reverse aging in planaria. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll understand both the data as well as all of those things that I just told you. All right. So in case you missed my first slide, my name is still Andrew. That's still me. Uh, this was me uh, in high school uh, at the little symposium where I first presented my research. Uh, I'm originally from North Central New Jersey. It's about a two hour drive from here without traffic. Of course, there's never no traffic. Uh, and I've lived my entire life here in the Northeast. When I was your age, I was really interested in chemistry. And so when I got into high school, I took some really hard chemistry classes and there was a whole bunch of math and I didn't understand most of it. And to be honest, I did not do great. It wasn't until I got into biology one in the spring that I really found my footing. I was really fortunate that I had some really great teachers and a really great biology program, and I really learned a lot. While at while in high school, I got the chance to work in a real lab twice. Once over the course of a summer through a program at Rutgers that was designed to teach molecular biology techniques, and once in Robert Schneider's lab at NYU, uh, where I studied the mechanisms of drug resistance in breast cancer. Through both of these two experiences, I learned that I really enjoyed working in a lab and thinking like a scientist. Uh, when I graduated uh, from uh, high school, I went off to Brown University to study biology and English. And again, this is me here in college. Uh, and I once again found myself wanting to work in a lab. Given that I'd really enjoyed my experience in a cancer biology lab, I decided I wanted to study cancer. And I sent emails to a dozen professors, all of whom studied cancer biology, and I didn't hear back from any of them. Next year, tried again, got one response from Dr. John Sedeby. Now, John didn't study cancer biology. He studied the biology of aging, but I figured that was close enough and I didn't really have any other options, so I went with it. In the Sedeby lab, I studied resistance to osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a condition with age where your bones become increasingly weak and fragile, ultimately resulting in weakness and, and in fractures. Uh, and I studied in a strain of mice that live way longer than usual. Even though it wasn't cancer biology, I really enjoyed my time in the Sedevi lab, and I learned a lot about the biology of aging. After graduating from college, uh, I went on to grad school here at Yale, and I once again decided to look for cancer biology labs. I tried out a couple, but ultimately decided to join the Van Wolfswinkel lab, where I am today, and I honestly couldn't be happier. But, and I'm really looking forward to showing you a little bit of my data here today. But before I do, I want to give you two quick lessons based on my experiences. First, science classes are great. They're really important uh, for teaching you the material that you need to know, but the only way that you're going to know if you like science is by doing it. So as you get older, if you think you're interested in research, look into programs that give you the chance to work in a lab. Those programs are definitely out there. I can tell you have, we have a high school student working in our lab right now, but you need to take the initiative to find them. And second, keep an open mind. Uh, don't bottle yourself up, off from kind of trying things out just because they're not what you think you want to do. The only way you're going to learn if something is right for you is by giving it a try. All right, with that out of the way, let's get right into the science. Uh, so some of you might have noticed that I've been interested in the biology of aging for some time. And, oh, hello. Uh, and so you might wonder, well, why is that? Why do we think that is? And uh, I'm hardly the first person to be interested in ways of extending lifespan. Humans have been speculating about ways they might live forever for thousands of years. Can you guys think of any sort of books you might have read or movies you might have seen, any media you've encountered uh, that sort of has people trying to live forever? You can just put your answers in the chat if you want. Uh, well, while you do that, I'll talk about some of the uh, some of the oldest pieces of human literature. Uh, in this case, the Epic of Ilermesh, great. Uh, job, Joshua, for putting that within Dragon Ball, another great choice. Uh, 
<laughs> a bunch of great uh, choices, people. Uh, so yes, the Epic of Gilgamesh is in large part about, was one of the oldest pieces of human literature ever written. You can see a fragment of it here. Uh, and it's in large part about one's quest, man's quest for immortality. After the death of his close friend Enkidu, Gilgamesh seeks out the mythical plant of heartbeat and herb with the power to let him live forever. And human kind of desire for immortality didn't end there. In China, for example, uh, alchemists used a variety of ingredients to brew a liquid called the golden elixir, which was rumored to grant immortality to whomever drank it. In reality, these preparations were often toxic and were responsible for the death of at least nine Chinese emperors. Meanwhile, over in Europe, alchemists tried numerous times to create the mythical philosopher's stone, uh, which was, again, believed to grant the wielder eternal life. And apart from scientific discoveries, uh, the quest for immortality also inspired other sorts of discoveries. Many Spanish conquistadors, such as Juan Ponce de Leon, were inspired by the search for the fountain of youth, great job, uh, which they believed to be somewhere in Florida. All of this is to say that efforts to extend our natural lifespan are hardly a new thing. And this shouldn't surprise any of us. Aging is one of the few universal human experiences. And I'll let you in on a secret. It really, really is unpleasant. I'm only 25, and I'm beginning to experience some of those early symptoms of aging. I'm going bald. Uh, my back hurts. I'm lower on energy than I used to be. And it's only going to get worse from here, unfortunately. What I'm showing you here is a pie chart. Uh, and in blue, what we have here, uh, so this chart in general shows the most common causes of death in the United States in 2019. Uh, you can tell it's 2019 because COVID isn't on this list. Uh, and as you can see, age-related diseases, which are here shown here in blue, make up more than two thirds of the leading causes of death nationwide, including some diseases you might be familiar with, like heart attack, stroke, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, as well as some that you might not expect or have heard of, like diabetes or kidney failure. In short, aging is responsible for a significant amount of human suffering and death, and despite thousands of years of investigation, we have yet to find a cure. Nope, try that again. But what actually is aging on a fundamental level? Unlike relatively simple diseases like the flu, for example, aging doesn't have a single cause. Instead, it affects every organ in your body in different ways. And there's been a lot of work to study these quote unquote hallmarks of aging, how, why, where they occur, but none of that is really relevant to this talk right now. Instead, we're gonna take a simpler approach. At its heart, aging is the accumulation of damage in your body over time. That can be cell damage, molecular damage, organ damage, et cetera, et cetera. You can think of this damage sort of like garbage. It gets produced every day in your body by cells doing things that they do naturally, like breaking down food for energy or replicating more of themselves. Different types of garbage get made in different places. In some cells, damage to your DNA creates mutations that can't be fixed. In others, proteins clump up and stop working properly. And in still others, fats and sugars react with molecules that they're not supposed to. And while your body can clean up some of this damage, eventually it begins to pile up. And when that happens, this garbage gets in the way of things and makes us sick. Damaged molecules pile up in our cells until those cells don't work properly, which then causes the organs that those cells are part of to fail as well, ultimately resulting in death. And while this sounds pretty grim, I actually find it kind of hopeful. It means that aging isn't just some kind of magical thing that sort of happens to us. It's a biological process like any other. And that means we can find ways to slow it down or maybe even prevent it entirely. Let's look at a couple of examples of what different lifespans look at like across the animal kingdom. Uh, so what I'm gonna show you here is a couple of different creatures and how long they live on average. The short-lived creatures will be here on this red end of the line and the long-lived creatures are going to be here on this far purple end of the line. And as I go through these, I want you to think to yourself, are there any patterns that you see? Because later on in our interactive activity, you're gonna take a collection of nine mammals that I'll give you, and you're gonna try and sort them by how long you think they live. So we'll start out with the roundworm, C. elegans. This guy is relatively short-lived. It only lives about 19 days. Uh, next up, we have, next up, we have the fruit fly, uh, which if you've ever gotten any living in your trash, you'll know lives quite a bit longer, typically between two to three months. Uh, the brown rat, our Norgevicus, is one of the shortest lived mammals with an average lifespan of around two years. And zebrafish, Danny Oririo, live about three years. So why did I pick these animals to start out with? 
Well, these are some of the most commonly studied model organisms in science, which is really interesting because they're all so short-lived. And this makes sense to some extent, right? If you're doing an experiment, it's much you can get results much faster if you only have to wait 19 days as opposed to if you have to wait three years or if you have to wait, say, 70 years in humans, for example. But the issue is, if you want to learn more about how animals resist aging, you have to focus on some animals that live longer. Next up, we have uh, the whooping crane. So birds uh, live longer in general than you expect, and the whooping crane is no different, living around 37-ish years or so. Humans live about 71 years, with women living significantly longer than men. That's true in a lot of species throughout the animal kingdom for reasons we don't quite understand yet. Now we get to organisms that live longer than humans. Galapagos tortoises, for example, live more than 150 years. We actually don't know how long their maximum lifespan is because they outlive the scientists that keep track of them. Finally, if we leave the animal kingdom and look at things like plants, trees tend to be especially long-lived. You've all probably heard of redwoods that are estimated to be over 500 years old, but even your common oak tree will live past 150. And there are some creatures that live even longer than that. So why am I showing you this? Well, if you remember on that previous slide, I told you that aging results from the accumulation of garbage in your body. And over time, that outpaces your body's ability to clear up that garbage. But some creatures like this tree here or the Galapagos tortoise, uh, they live longer than humans. And that means something has to be special about those creatures. Maybe they make less garbage or maybe they're affected by it less or maybe they're just better at clearing, cleaning it up somehow. If we want to learn more about how to extend human lifespan, we have to study creatures that live longer than us, which hopefully is a great segue to the creatures that we study in our lab. So the creatures we study in the Van Wolfswinkel lab are Planaria, uh, Schmitte Mediterranea specifically, but I'll just call them Planaria from now on. Uh, so they look like this image here on the left, and I have um, a couple of sort of pictures uh, here. Uh, so this is one a worm when it's freshly hatched from an egg. Uh, these guys were hatched just about a week ago. Uh, and this guy here has been alive for almost a year and a half at this point. Uh, and this paper clip is just here for scale. Uh, and this little kind of sphere thing is one of the eggs that I mentioned that they sort of hatch from. Uh, they range in size, as you can see, from really no bigger than a grain of rice to about the length of your thumb. Uh, and as the name kind of... Uh, Good question. We'll, we'll get to that one later. Um, and these worms, actually, here you can, if I, if you kind of look over to my camera, um, you might, I can kind of show you what one of these worms looks like in real life. Um, I don't know if I've been spotlit, but uh, so this kind of test tube contains one of these worms, actually the same worm that I'm showing you in that picture here. You can kind of see him crawling along the side of the test tube here, and this is one of those eggs. Um, so they, uh, these guys are native to sort of streams and ponds around the Mediterranean Sea. I'll just give you another quick moment to look close at them before I put them away. Uh, and the worms we keep in the lab were originally fished out of a fountain here in, in Barcelona, Spain. So we describe these worms as free living freshwater flatworms. Let me break that down for you. Free living means that these worms aren't parasites, right? They live on their own. Typically, they're bottom feeders and scavengers. Uh, freshwater means that they live in freshwater. Typically, they hide under rocks in streams and ponds. Uh, and flatworms is both a literal description of their shape, which you might have been able to see if kind of uh, when I sort of held it up that way, uh, and also a taxonomic description. So to orient you, uh, this is a chart that we call a phylogenetic tree. And it ranks basically all the animals in this case on how kind of similar they are to each other. Uh, so uh, for example, chordates, which you can sort of see here, uh, which includes various mammals, including humans, are most closely related to echinoderms, which includes starfish that you can see here. And they're most distantly related from periphera, which are sponges that you can see here. Now there are three different groups here that we could consider worms. We have our nematodes, which are these little guys here. Uh, and those include roundworms like C. elegans that I showed you on the previous slide. It's a commonly used organism in science. Uh, we have annelids. These are the segmented worms. They're what you kind of classically think of when you think worms. These are your earthworms, your leeches, that sort of thing. And then finally, we have platyhelminths or flatworms like this guy here. So this sort of taxonomically is where we're talking about on the tree of life. 
the reason I'm sort of showing you this is while flatworms are more distantly related to us than say mice or other chordates that you can see here, they're just as closely related to us as insects or as nematodes, which are both commonly used models for scientific research. And despite their sort of genetic differences, these worms are actually pretty similar to us in a lot of ways. Uh, so they have a lot of similar organs and organ systems to us. And we're going to do a little exercise quickly together. And if you happen to attend Arcadia's talk a couple of years back, you might have a leg up if you remember some of the answers to these questions. Uh, so what I'm going to show you here are some pictures. And each of these pictures is a picture of an actual worm that we took that we treated with a special chemical to highlight a particular organ or an organ system that's similar to one that we have in humans. I want you guys to take 30 seconds to sort of look at each of these and think to yourself, try to come up with a hypothesis of which organ is which. And they get harder as you move here from left to right. And then we'll go over them all together. Uh, so why don't you take 30 seconds? And uh, if you have kind of guesses, you can start posting them in the chat now, uh, or you can keep them to yourself and post them as we go through them. People are a bit shy. That's totally okay. We're going to go over them, so don't worry. And there are no wrong answers. We're just testing our intuition out. So let's uh, let me start talking through some of these. So let's start with this first guy here on the left. Uh, so this is an organ that seems to go all around the outside of the animal and has this little hole here in kind of the middle of the animal, uh, which is almost like sort of a a mouth. Uh, and yeah, I see someone has put the right answer in the chat. Yes. So this is their epidermis or their skin. Uh, so the next one here, uh, this is one that's kind of inside their body. Uh, it's sort of concentrated uh, in the kind of the head region of the worm, but there are also these two sort of long branches that go down the middle of the worm. Uh, and I, again, see bloodstream is a good guess. Actually, the worms don't have any blood, uh, but that is a, a good guess. These are nerves or neurons. So this kind of clump uh, here in the head is the brain of the worm. And then these two long kind of cords, you can think of as sort of like the spinal cord equivalent to the worms. Uh, so next up, uh, the next two are sort of easier to think about as a pair. So one of them is this sort of tube that goes from what we described as kind of the mouth here uh, that goes somewhere into the body. And the next is this, the other is this kind of long branch structure that goes all around the body. Um, any kind of guesses? Excretory stomach, those are, are good guesses. Uh, and they're kind of, yes. So you guys are kind of getting the gist of this here. Uh, so these two are the pharynx, which is analogous to the mouth or the throat in humans, uh, and the intestines, uh, which kind of break down energy or break down food into energy uh, that the worm sort of uses. Uh, skeleton's also a good guess. The worms actually don't have a skeleton. They're relatively kind of soft and floppy. Uh, but it, you, I, I see why you would sort of say that. All right, next up. So this one is kind of hard, uh, but this sort of system is found all around the worm, and it seems to be concentrated a little bit here in the tail. Uh, this is pretty challenging. Any guesses? Skin and blood I'm seeing a lot of. So as I mentioned, sort of the worms don't really have blood. Uh, they, they're unlike us in that respect. And the skin we already saw, there we go. Uh, I saw someone put it, muscle. Uh, so yeah, these are the muscles. The reason that they have this kind of clump in the tail is because they use that to sort of steer when they swim around. And then the last one, this one's, oops, this one's really hard, uh, but it's these kind of little sort of dot-like structures. And if you actually look at them, they seem to be concentrated on the ends of these intestinal branches. Uh, any guesses about those? Endocrine's a close guess. Hairs isn't a bad idea. No, these worms don't have hairs. Uh, nerves, not, not quite. So these are actually kidney-like structures. So obviously in humans, we only have two kidneys. Uh, in the worms, they have a lot more. Uh, and what these kidneys do is they help filter the uh, kind of the food and the waste that comes to them through the intestines and help the worm stay healthy and safe. All right, great job, guys. That's really, really good. Uh, and the ones that we missed uh, are really, really tough. Uh, 
But despite being really similar to us in this respect, these planarians are interesting to me from the perspective of the biology of aging because they're really, really long lived. Uh, some of these worms are, so the technical term that we use to describe these worms is negligibly senescent. And what that means is they have no significant increase in morbidity or mortality over time. In short, they don't seem to develop age-related diseases uh, like cancer, Alzheimer's disease. The worms just don't seem to get them. And some of the worms are even believed to be over 5 million years old. That's crazy. And all of those organ systems that I just mentioned, they managed to keep those up and running seemingly forever. That means no wrinkles in their skin, no Alzheimer's disease in their brain, no weakness in their muscles for thousands and thousands of years. This is a really awesome property, and we'd love to learn more about how they manage it. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't at least touch on the other really interesting property these worms have, which is regeneration. So what is regeneration? Well, when you get a cut, uh, it takes a while, right? But the wound does eventually heal. But the skin isn't the same as it was before. It's usually not as flexible. And if the wound is serious enough, you're left with a visible scar, which might never heal. And if the injury is even bigger, like a missing finger or a toe, it will never grow back. Planaria are one of the only animals that are capable of what we call complete bilateral re uh, regeneration throughout their entire lives. And what that means is if you take one of these worms, you cut it in half, really anywhere in the worm, uh, within two to three weeks, the head, will grow a new tail, the tail will grow a new head, and you'll end up with two whole new worms. In fact, some animals take advantage of this process to reproduce. Rather than laying eggs, they just tear themselves in half, and then the two halves can each regenerate back into a full worm. Yeah, I know, it's awesome. Experiments performed in the late 1800s by Thomas Hunt Morgan, one of the pioneers of modern genetics, showed that you can take one of these worms and cut it into as many as 256 pieces, and many of those pieces will be able to recover from the injuries and grow back into a whole worm. Yeah, it is like cloning. That's a, a kind of a good comparison uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, so that's absolutely crazy, right? Uh, but it does present an interesting problem, right? Suppose you take one of these worms uh, and you cut it at line 10 here, right? The tail piece can't just close up the wound and call it a day. It has to replace a whole bunch of missing organs. and this kind of tailpiece doesn't really have a mouth, so it can't eat to get the energy that it needs to replace those missing organs. So what does it do? Well, when your body needs energy and you can't eat, like when you're lifting weights or out on a run, your body burns fat. It breaks down fat cells and molecules in order to produce the energy that you need. These worms do a similar thing, but they don't have a dedicated fat cell to store energy. Instead, they break down pieces of their body that they don't need anymore. And I hypothesize that this is the secret to these planarians' long lives. These worms start out young, right, right here, but just like at us, as they grow older, garbage starts to build up in their bodies. However, at, when the worms become injured, they regenerate. And when they regenerate, in order to meet the energy demands of regeneration, they recycle some of this age-related garbage, breaking it down and using it as a source of energy and raw materials to build their body. So now I'm going to talk to you about a little bit of the actual data I have generated to test this hypothesis. Uh, so I started with a very simple experiment. I wanted to determine if the worms actually accumulated any age-related damage over time. So in short, to see if this dark green arrow here in our model is correct. Uh, in order to do this, I looked at fertility as a way of measuring age-related damage. Now, declining fertility is one of the earliest signs of aging in humans and in other animals, and it's very easy to track. You can just count the number of eggs that the worm produces and see how that changes over time. That's exactly what I did. Uh, I took a group of freshly hatched worms and I tracked how many eggs they produced every week for almost a year. So what I'm going to show you here is a line graph. Uh, each dot on the line graph represents the amount of capsules that worms produce on a particular week. Uh, and then kind of the, the axis down here shows the actual amount of time post hatching. So I want you guys to think, assuming our hypothesis is true, assuming that these worms do accumulate age-related damage over time, as shown by this kind of green arrow here, what sort of pattern would you expect to see? Uh, when the worms are just freshly hatched and are still in the process of kind of maturing and growing, you expect the amount of eggs that they lay to be high or low? You can just put it in the chat.
Okay, I'm seeing a lot of low. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. That is what we would expect. Uh, and then as the worm reaches maturity, what happens to its fertility, do you think? Do you think it'll stay the same? Do you think it'll go up? Yep, great job. I'm seeing a lot of go ups. And then as the worm ages, assuming it accumulates damage, like I sort of suggested in the model, what do you think will happen to the fertility? Will it stay the same? Will it go further up or will it go down? I see a lot of people saying it will go down. So when you look at the actual data, we can see if it matches what we expect to see in our hypothesis. So this is what the data actually looks like. Uh, you can see here that as we expected, it takes the worm quite a bit of time to reach fertility, uh, about 77 days. But once they do, they begin producing offspring. Uh, but what's surprising, or not surprising, what we expect to see actually is that the fertility actually declines pretty rapidly. And by day, you know, 200 or so after hatching, these worms are almost completely infertile. These results suggest that this first part of our model here is correct, that under normal conditions, the worms accumulate age-related garbage that impaired their fertility over time. Now, what about this second part of our model? These uh, other two um, sort of arrows here, the injury and and regeneration. Does this help take out some of this age-related garbage? In order to answer this experiment, this question, I performed a very similar experiment, but this time I started out with aged worms. I then, uh, like you saw kind of at the end of the graph on the previous slide, I cut these worms in half, gave them some time to regenerate and regrow, and then I again tracked their fertility over time. So here is, here is another line graph like the previous one. And as you can see in these three weeks before the experiment started, none of the worms produced any eggs. They are sort of infertile. Now, again, I want you to think, what are the data going to look like if our model is correct? And how will it be different, if at all, from the previous graph? So let's start out in this kind of regeneration phase. So this is when the worm has just been amputated uh, and is in the process of recovering and rebuilding its organs. Do you expect the number of offspring it produces to be high or low? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of lows. All right. Uh, so then once the worm has kind of finished rebuilding its body, uh, what do you guys will think will happen to the fertility? Will it go up? Will it stay the same? Will it go down? I see it go up, go up a bit. Some think it will stay low. Some think it will go up. We'll, we'll see what actually happens. Uh, and then finally, as the worm continues to age, do you think the fertility will go down again? Do you think it will stay constant? What will sort of happen? Yeah, so most people think that it will go down. So we're, we're a little bit undecided about what's going to happen here in the middle. So we'll, we'll see what that actually looks like. So uh, when we amputate the worm, it again takes them a little bit of time to regrow and recover. It's actually faster uh, than if we raise them from kind of eggs. Uh, but we do see a brief burst of fertility. Now, you guys probably noticed this isn't as strong as that fertility peak we saw the first time around. It doesn't last as long, and it's not clearly as big. Uh, and that suggests that regeneration may not completely restore or reverse aging, but that it only partially reverses aging. But nonetheless, even a single cycle of amputation and regeneration can partly restore fertility to aged and fertile worms. And that suggests that regeneration might actually be reducing the accumulation of age-related damage and possibly reversing aging, which is super, super cool. Uh, so what have we learned today? Three main things. First off, aging isn't magic. It's a biological process like any other, and it results from the accumulation of damage over time in your body. Second, planaria are really, really awesome. Uh, they're highly resistant to aging, and my evidence suggests that this resistance to aging might be partly conferred by their regenerative capacity, which allows and forces them to recycle age-damaged cells and molecules. And while a lot of talks on aging are kind of full of doom and gloom, I want to end this one on a happy note. At the start of my talk, I mentioned humanity's quest for the elixir of life. What I didn't mention is that we actually discovered something very close to it in the early 1900s. Uh, so in 1945, Alexander Fleming, this guy here, uh, won the Nobel Prize for discovering this molecule. Does anyone happen to know what this molecule is? You can put guesses in the chat if you want. All right. So this is, there we go, penicillin. Uh, yes. 
Uh, so penicillin is one of the first readily available antibiotics. And at the start of the 1900s, the average person only lived about 47 years due to high death rates from infectious diseases. Penicillin and other antibiotics helped to control these diseases, nearly doubling the average human lifespan to the approximately 71 years it is today. What most people don't know is that Dr. Fleming didn't invent penicillin. He discovered it. The chemical is being naturally produced by this mold, Penicillium chrysogenium. Fleming just discovered its antibiotic properties and made it work in humans. Nature has already given us organisms that are highly resistant to aging. It's only a matter of time until we figure out how it works and hopefully port that over to humans. The Methuselah Foundation, which is an organization that is dedicated to funding aging-related research, believes that the first human to live to a thousand years old is alive today. I sincerely hope that's one of you, that you live long, healthy, and most importantly, happy lives. And if you're interested in science, that science is a part of those lives. Thank you. Uh, okay, so now we're going to go into our interactive activity if uh, my fellow uh, volunteers are able to help. So I'm gonna explain briefly what the activity is going to be, and then we're gonna split off into break breakout rooms and kind of discuss it, work together as a team and see if we can come to the answers. And then after that, we can answer some of the questions that came up during the talk. Uh, so what we have here are a selection of nine mammals. Uh, and these mammals are uh, various different creatures. Some of them are kind of semi-aquatic, like the duck-billed platypus. Some of them are flying, like this sort of gray-headed flying fox. But the point is we have eight or nine, sorry, nine different mammals. Uh, and what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to sort these mammals by how long you think they live. And as you're doing this, I want you to think to yourself, well, first off, do you specifically know or want to guess how long those lifespans are? And also, are there any, are there any sort of trends that you observe with lifespan? Do you know, is there some kind of particular factor that tracks how long an animal or predicts how long an animal might live? Uh, so what I'm going to do is, oh, I don't know if I put it on the screen here, so I'm going to just paste it into the chat. Uh, there's going to be a link that you'll click, which will take you to a website where you can kind of rank the animals by how long you think they live. Uh, and you're going to put the shorter lived animals at the bottom of that list and the longer lived animals at the top of that list. And then when you're done, uh, before the end of the breakout room, you're just going to click submit. Uh, and then we'll talk about the results together, as well as the trends that we have observed. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I will share my screen. All right. So this is what you guys thought uh, from the interactive activity uh, of what sort of the well, it's kind of the age of the animals or the lifespan of these animals are. Uh, so we have at ninth the mouse, uh, that little house mouse here. Uh, and does anyone want to kind of comment about why they thought the mouse was so short lived? You can just put it in the chat. Or you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Andrew, I can speak a little bit for like the discussions we had in our oh, group. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, I mean, also yeah. just mentioned in the chat, but we talked a lot about size as a thought gotcha. for, for how we yeah. were putting ours in order. And then some of it was just what we felt like. And then someone in our lab mm -hmm. actually knew exactly what the lifespan of an elephant was. So that was really helpful. So That's really helpful. Yeah. And I see a lot of people in chat also saying that it's that it's small. And yeah, that's interesting. And I also noticed that people tend to put the larger animals like the, the blue whale here and the elephant near the top of the list. Uh, and so that's consistent. And did you guys think perhaps at all uh, about why some of these animals that are sort of smaller tend to be shorter lived? And again, you can, you can chat it out, you can put it in the chat, whatever you guys would like to. I have one person who says that it has a lot of sort of things preying on it and could die very easily. Yeah, that's absolutely a big part of it. Uh, someone says not sort of a lot of, of as much sort of space to hold garbage. Other people have kind of mentioned that it's smaller and therefore less complicated. These are all absolutely factors that are sort of important. Uh, some uh, other people are commenting about sort of heartbeats or food. Yeah, that's an, also uh, a really interesting point. Uh, typically, smaller animals tend to have faster metabolism, and so they produce a lot of this garbage a lot faster than some of those uh, larger, older animals. Uh, another part of it is just sort of physiologically, you know, it takes a certain amount of time for an animal to grow to a certain size. And if you have an animal that's really, really big, uh, it just takes a long time for them to get there. 
Um, so yeah, these are sort of great intuitions. Uh, and you did a really good job sort of thinking about um, the kind of causes of the trends that we see here. You're starting to think like scientists, which is really good. Uh, so I'll go through the answers briefly. Uh, yeah, the mole rat is tricky. We'll talk about that. Uh, so you, absolutely everyone was correct. The house mouse is at the bottom of the list. They live on average about two years. Uh, I know some people in my room got that exactly, which is very, very impressive. Uh, I don't think I could do that personally. Uh, next up, we have the rabbit, which I believe is what people kind of put as second, living about nine years. Uh, the uh, gray-headed flying fox uh, live about 15 years. Uh, typically, bats are actually longer lived than we expect. I just picked a bad example for this one. Uh, 15 years is still kind of a, a long time for a, for a bat. Platypus, uh, despite having a bunch of really interesting sort of properties related to its, you know, semi-aquatic nature, uh, only lives about 17 years on average. A um, uh, grizzly bear, 22 and a half years. Um, naked mole rat is 30 years. Now that one's exciting because that's a really, really small animal uh, compared to some of the other ones that we've seen so far. Uh, chimpanzee, 37 and a half years. Uh, they share a lot of their genetics and are similar a lot to humans. And so they tend to be kind of longer lived than we might expect. And then last, we have the African elephant at 65 years and the blue whale at 85 years. And I wanna mention that a number of other whales, I think the humpback whale, for example, are even longer lived than that. And as you guys kind of pointed out, uh, we can think of a relationship between how big the animal is and how long it lives. And so if we plot, we do some fancy math, uh, and we plot the weight of each of these animals against their lifespan, we can see that as animals get bigger, they tend to live longer. And now there are a couple of exceptions here. For example, the mouse, you can see it really is far away from the sort of predicted line. This suggests the mouse lives a lot shorter than we would expect just based upon its weight. By contrast, the naked mole rat, which a couple of you pointed out, actually lives a lot longer than we would expect based on its weight. As scientists, these particular animals are really interesting to us because they uh, have kind of uh, unique properties that are worth sort of studying. So yeah, thank you very much for your participation in the activity. I really appreciated it. And I can take questions if there's time. Hi, Andrew. Yes, we have actually lots of questions in the chat. Oh, lovely. Um, and since we are kind of near the end of our time, yes. maybe if you can, we can blitz through a couple with just some quick answers so we can get through as many questions as possible, um, even though I know some of them might be kind of tricky. Um, so one of the questions that a lot of people have been asking, are they still the same worms? When you cut them in half, are we sure they're the same worms and not clones or? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, it's sort of a philosophical question. Uh, there's at the very least, we don't think there's a difference between the head and their tail sort of lifespan. We've been have some worms in our lab that we've been cutting over and over again every three weeks for at this point, six years. And both of the heads and the tails are still alive. So we don't think there's a fundamental difference between the two pieces, at least. And another question we have kind of in the same vein, if the worm is born with some sort of defect, when you, when it, does it grow back? Does it solve the defect? Does it, yeah. Does it do the same thing again? Great question. Uh, most of the time that will solve the defect. Sometimes we'll get a worm that's born with two heads or two tails. And usually if you cut it in half, uh, that typically will solve the defect. Wow. Okay. Another question we had is, um, do the worms need to eat and what do they eat? Or yeah, do they great live? question. Uh, so yes, they need to eat. Um, they, in the wild, they typically will feed on dead things, you know, corpses of fish or things that fall to the bottom of the stream. In our lab, we feed them liver, uh, organic cow liver paste, uh, which is, uh, we just found that they like eating and it gives them all the nutrients they need. Okay. Another question we have is what happens if a worm gets burned or if the flesh is destroyed in some way, can it like regrow that back? The answer, uh, good question. Uh, we haven't looked into that too much. I, I'd be interested to see. Yeah, good. I don't know. Okay. Um, another question. Um, what happens if you cut it into three? <laughs> Great question. Yeah. Uh, so all three pieces will grow back. In fact, you can cut them any way you want. You can cut little wedges out. You can cut uh, sort of a like, like a cookie cutter out from the center. All of those will grow back uh, with one or two small exceptions. Yeah, that is really cool. Okay. And then the last question we have is, if all these things are true and all these things have happened, then how do they die? Or do Great they? Great question. Uh, so they don't usually, we don't think of them as typically dying naturally, but they can still uh, die of things like there not being enough oxygen in their water or them drying out or there being too much salt in their water, that sort of thing. 
they can also starve to death for if they're kind of not fed for long enough. Uh, and of course, they can be eaten, you know, predated upon by fish. There's sort of a minimum size from which they can kind of regenerate. Uh, so while they don't typically die on their own, it's definitely possible to kill them. And I have done that accidentally at least once. Uh, well, it must feel like a lot of power to kill kind of an unkillable creature. So um, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, it's just just a shame that we can't use it for experiments. Fair, fair. All right, Andrew. Well, thank you so, so very much for such an amazing presentation. Um, I know everyone in my breakout room um, loved your presentation and it generated a lot of discussion um, and a lot of philosophical questions for us to think about as um, we, uh, you know, continue the rest of our day. So thank you so much for being here with us today. My and pleasure. I'll pass thank it you over so much to for another uh, volunteer to close up the session. Sorry, Zoom really doesn't want me uh, sharing my screen. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to do the outro. Um, thank you everyone for coming. And uh, next month, we will have another Exploring Science where we will hear from um, Constantine, who is a grad student in astronomy. So I know some people in my breakout room were very interested in astronomy. So um, if you're interested, please come back next month on March 28th um, and hope to see a lot of you then. <laughs>